And if you would turn in your Bible to Psalm 1 this morning, and then we're going to eventually make our way to Genesis chapter 27 as well. Um, Last week, if you were with us, I said, so last Sunday I said, this coming Wednesday, we are going to be teaching through chapters 26 and 27 of Genesis, and uh, it's time for confession, I lied. Uh, We didn't make it past chapter 25, but I say with great confidence today, this coming Wednesday, we are going to make it through chapter 26 and 27 as we... uh, go verse by verse, uh, continue this journey through Genesis. But as I said this morning, and we're going to dive a little deeper into something here in chapter 27, but I want to begin by reading the first few verses of Psalm 1, one of my all-time, honestly, favorite psalms. And uh, I just want to read the first half of Psalm 1. It says, blessed is the man. And that's what I I want us to understand and stop and just recognize real quick, is that this psalm describes the blessed man or woman. Blessed, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And he, and in his law, he meditates day and night. He, the blessed man, shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he, whatever this blessed man does, shall prosper. I'm going to pray one more time. Lord, as we just consider what it is to be blessed, Uh, Lord, to understand that you're a blessing God, Lord, that you want these things for our life. I pray, Lord, that you teach us and instruct us again this morning uh, by your spirit, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, Anybody ever watch the TV show Family Feud? Uh, It's got Steve Harvey's the host now. When I was growing up, it was Richard Dawson. You guys remember that? Survey says, you know? And um, I, I remember my older brother used to keep a notebook. Do you, my sister's here, do you remember this notebook? No, okay. Um, and he would write, as we would watch Family Feud, he would write all the questions asked in his little notebook. I can still picture it in my mind. And then he would write all the responses with the appropriate, you know, percentage, uh, you know, out of a hundred things. And when I was younger, I wondered, why is my brother keeping this notebook with all the Family Feud questions and answers? And now that I'm older, I still don't know why. Um, (laughs) I'm going to have to ask him. I I still don't get it. But uh, it was a fun show. Richard Dawson was a hoot on there. But for many of us, the fact is, in, in, in this room, for many of us probably, the fact is that feuds and family and family and feuds, they unfortunately, they go hand in hand for a lot of us, okay? Um, perhaps it's not quite this story. Check out this from a couple of years ago in Elko, Nevada. Charlotte Moore, Charlotte Moore, 36, an 11-year veteran of the Elko County Sheriff's Department, was off duty when she was pulled over and charged with driving under the influence by her husband, Deputy Mike Moore. That's not good when your husband pulls you over for a DUI, especially when you're in the exact same department. And you know what? Charlotte wasn't too fond of it either. The article goes on to say she allegedly left before being administered a portable breathalyzer test. (laughs) It just cracks me up, okay? She's pulled over for this DUI, and she recognized, I'm in a moment that a decision needs to be made, and I'm making the decision. My husband does not need to give me a breathalyzer. I don't care who he is. And she peels out of there, okay? This now is a moment of decision for her husband, Mike. He needs to make a decision. I pulled over my wife, and she just took off without the breathalyzer. So the article goes on. Mike Moore pulled her over again and called the Elko Police Department for backup. (laughs) 
<laughs> he left shortly after another officer arrived. I'm sure it's out of concern for his own safety at this point, right? Uh, it just cracks me up. Like, I, just, I picture it like a sitcom, right? And she just peels off, and he's like, oh, no, I've got to go do this again, like Roscoe or something. Like, oh, here we go. Uh, so and it goes on to say, Charlotte Moore was released and placed on paid administrative leave. Neither Mike nor Charlotte were available for comment. And I imagine... <laughs> They were not, and I also imagine he probably slept on the couch for a while <laughs> after that. Family feuds are nothing new. As I said, there's probably, even in this room right now, there's probably some of you that are experiencing a family feud. Things within your, your family aren't what they, what they should be. And we certainly see that in Genesis chapter 27 this morning. Now, if I have you at chapter 27, I want you to look over the page, maybe a page back, at chapter 25 Verse 27, chapter 25, verse 7, 27. Because you see, this family feud just didn't start out of nowhere. The, this is a house divided, and mom and dad did not help the situation. It says in chapter 25, verse 27 and 28, the boys grew. That's Jacob and Esau. And Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. Notice verse 28. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. There's favoritism among these kids, and it's this dysfunctional family dynamic. It's going to cause all sorts of hurt and pain, just debilitating pain in their lives. And in chapter 27, it's like the final blow up. They've been different all along. But chapter 27 is finally, it all comes to the head. And it's over, this feud is over the blessing of God, receiving this blessing, okay? The blessing within scripture to define it for us is this prophetic pronouncement of uh, seeking and speaking God's goodness in one's life, okay? In the evangelical dictionary, Walt, Pastor Walter Elwell defines a blessing this way. Two distinct ideas are present. First, a blessing was a public declaration of a favored status with God. Second, the blessing endued power for prosperity and success. In all cases, the blessing served as a guide and motivation to pursue a course of life within the blessing. As we make our way through the majority of this chapter here this morning, we're going to notice that all four characters in this story, every single one of them, Isaac, Rebekah, Esau, and Jacob, they all understand the value of the blessing. The problem isn't, let's get that out of our mind, the problem is they don't understand what this is. They all understand and value the blessing. They desire God's blessing. His providence, his goodness, his grace in their life is something they and we, we should want for our lives. We should want God's blessing in our lives. We should desire, I hope it's our prayer this morning, that we would want to be that Psalm 1 person that we would want to be those that are bringing forth fruit in its season. We have exactly what is needed at exactly the right time. That we would be those whose leaves do not wither. No matter how dry and barren it is out there among us, around us, we are planted so deep, our roots run so deep that, man, everything else is dead, but we have life. And, and we should desire that, like this person in Psalm 1, that everything we do prospers. Who doesn't want that for their life, right? Who doesn't want to be fruitful and prosperous? The problem is, okay, we all want that, we all desire it. The problem is the way that these characters in chapter 27 and we go about trying to claim God's goodness and his blessing in our life. In this account, in chapter 27, Everyone desires and appreciates God's blessing, but they use all the wrong ways to try to acquire it, okay? And so chapter 27 is a four-scene drama. It's a tragedy. And let's begin with scene one, which is Isaac's disobedience. Chapter 27, verse one says, Now it came to pass, when Isaac 
was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son. And he answered him, here I am. So Isaac is old. He knows that he's old, right? He's around 135 years old here, okay? That's old. What he doesn't know, he's going to live for another nine chapters. <laughs> he, he's got another 45 years left. But, but we know, like, if you're familiar with the Bible, familiar with Genesis, you've, when you're a kid, you did the coloring book, we understand he is an old, blind man here. What I want us to kind of rewrite and reprogram ourselves in is that uh, these are not going to be two strapping, strong young boys that come into him for a blessing. His boys, these twin boys, Jacob and Esau, they're eating off the senior menu too, okay? They're about 77 years old when this takes place. I think that's important for us to keep in mind. So Isaac called his older old son Esau, verse 2, and said, Behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please... Take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat it, that my soul may bless you before I die. Okay? He thinks he's, he's going to die. He's old. He, he doesn't, like he said, he doesn't know how much time he has left. He knows that he's old. He can't see. And what he wants to do as he wants to pass on what his father Abraham passed on to him, God's blessing. This pronouncement and promise over his life that he received, he wants now to pass this on to Esau. And so he says, Esau, you're my favorite son. Go get my favorite food. I'll be blessed, and then I'll bless you. You're my number one guy. Now, for most families this would be very appropriate. Usually, generally, the blessing went to the firstborn son, and that was Esau, just by a moment, right? If you remember, Esau was born, and then hanging on on the way out was Jacob's, grabbing onto his heel. It was like a two-for-oneer right there. They got both of them, right? So Esau was the firstborn son, and it's usually, normally, the firstborn son that would receive the blessing. The thing is, this is not a normal family and not a normal situation, God had told, if you're still there, just look back again to chapter 25. God sold Rebecca in chapter 25, verse 23. It says, two nations are in your womb. Speaking of Jacob and Esau and, and what would become of them, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. There's no doubt, right, that Isaac understood this. this. This was said to Rebecca, but I don't think she kept this as a secret. He, he understood this. He knew that this was God's plan. This was the way that God wanted to go about things. But here he is, ignoring what God had said and attempting to bless Esau, the older because that was his favorite. I got, he's got a soft spot for Big Red, okay? That's the one he wants to receive the blessing. At some point in time, Isaac said within himself, I know what God wants, but this is what I want. And my will is going to take precedence over his will. He made that decision at some point in his mind to disobey in that way. Now, we can do that too. Before we start pointing too many fingers at old Isaac here, we can do that too. Uh, you know, I know I'm supposed to turn the other cheek, that I'm supposed to be quick to forgive, but they don't deserve it, so I'm not going to forgive them. We know what God has said, but we want to do our thing. We know that we should honor our parents, that we should stay faithful in our marriages, that we should respect our husbands, love our wives. We might know what God wants. But like Isaac, there's times in our life too, I'm going to do it my way. I know what God wants, but this is what I'm doing, and this is what I have decided to do. My thing, my way. The problem is, he thinks, as his, he's working on this, and he's made this decision, he thinks this disobedience is going to pay off. I'm going to be able to, to do things my way instead of God's way. 
And so the lesson for us here to learn from Isaac is anytime we replace God's will with our will, when we set aside his plan, I know what his plan is, and say, that may be his plan, but I have this passion within me, this is what I want to do. Anytime, my friends, that we say, I don't want to do that, I want to do what I want to do, that's trouble. It's going to create a problem for you. It's going to cause hurt and anguish every time, okay? So this is lesson one, scene one, is Isaac's disobedience. Scene two, in verse five, stars the other half of the family. And this is, we see, Rebecca's determination. Verse five. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring him. So Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to I, uh, Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make, me, and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, notice this, like when Esau, excuse me, when Isaac called Esau, he said, You're my son. Here's Rebecca calling Jacob, My son. My son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Verse 9. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats. And I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it, that he may bless you before his death. It's just playing out. Isaac loved Esau, Jacob, or excuse me, Rebecca loved Jacob. And so she overhears this plan and says, well, I got a plan of my own, okay? Now, it would seem like, right, if we could just sit down and, and reason with Rebecca or like, why, why didn't she just walk in there and talk to Isaac? Maybe there's all this family drama and it's too much. She should have just sat down and said, hey, Isaac, I heard what you were saying. Let's not go against what the Lord has for us and our family. We know what God has planned for us. Let's stick to that plan. But instead of going in there and maybe having that hard conversation, she said, I'll just come up with my own way. Let's plot against dad, against my other son, and I can figure this thing out on my own. Now, I don't think that this is an isolated incident. I imagine there's probably been quite a bit of dysfunction before we even get to this point. If you know the story, if you know this drama, dad doesn't talk to mom anywhere in this. Mom doesn't talk to dad or Esau, and neither of the boys communicate. Okay, this is not good things are, are taking place in the home. But instead of going in and having this conversation with her husband, she has this plan. I know exactly how dad likes his food. I can cook it up. You bring it in. We'll steal the blessing. You're fine. You should be good to go. Now, Jacob should have said, this is wrong, right? I'm not going to go along with this. He's a 77-year-old man. But instead, verse 11, Jacob said to Rebecca, his mother, look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. Instead of saying, hey, this is wrong, he says, hey, Esau is hairy. I mean, let's not forget that, right? And I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. And I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. In other words, I want the blessing, but I don't want to get caught and make things worse. And so before she cooks up the savory food, she cooks up her plan a little bit more. Verse 13, his mother said to him, verse 13, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, get them for me. Verse 14, so he went and got them and brought them to his mother and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. Now, if you have kids that won't move out, <laughs> Esau is leaving his clothes around the house at 77 years old. Mind-blowing, right? It never ends. Okay, so she put... Verse 16, the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. How many of you guys have had goats or at least pet a goat? Okay. <laughs> How hairy do you have to be that this is the comparison? Like, I can't even tell the difference. 
Could be my son, could be a goat. I don't know. This is going to work, right? Verse 17, then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So she has thought of everyone, everything. He's got some laundry on the floor. I'll get the laundry. I'll get a, you know, some of his elk sweat cologne. He'll put that on. I'll make some food. Wear the goat skin. Bada bing, bada bang, bada boom. You've got a blessing. It's going to work out fine. She's got it all figured out. But God hasn't asked Rebecca to do any of this. She cooks up this plan all on her own, partially, I'm sure, out of her affection for Jacob. She loves Jacob. But also because how else will the plan and the promise of God come to pass unless I make it happen? She is mom in charge. And some of you know what I'm talking about. When Mama Bear sets her mind on something, there ain't nobody going to stop her. She is going to figure it out, get out of the way, right? In her desire for God's blessing and God's plan to take place the way that she wanted it to, she says, I got to take control of this situation. If things are going to get done the right way, I need to intervene. Anybody ever done that? If you've been a parent, you've done this, okay? I'm going to tell you the answer right now. I'm going to, I'm going to fix this. I can fix this for them. I think we all have, okay? There's times where we can be like Isaac. I'm just, I've heard what God has said. I'm going to do my own thing. That has happened to us all too, right? There's also times where like Rebecca, where we're trying to force the plan of God. This is how it's going to have to work out. I can see the end. I'll just do it myself, right? This is what Paul addressed to the, the Christians in Galatians 3, verse 3. He said, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? In other words, God started this thing and he's brought you to a certain point. Now you feel like you've got to finish the job? And this must have been the thought that Rebecca had too. How else will Jacob get this blessing I know he's supposed to have? This is, this, is life. this is the Christian life. This is walking in faith. It's understanding God is on the throne. I'm going to walk in obedience and do what he's calling me to do and trusting he will bring me to his desired end. Now, getting to that desired end, it might not be quite what I have desired and the route to get there might not be what I have chosen, but God doesn't need our help to get us there. If, we're, if Rebecca would have responded in a godly way, would have trust the Lord, how would have Jacob got this promised blessing? I don't know. But what I do know, Esau was never going to get it. This was always his blessing. God had a way, even if Rebecca didn't know what that was. Okay? This is the lesson that we can learn for some of us from Rebecca, is that when we try to get God's blessing through our own efforts, through our own manipulation, instead of God working out in his way and in his time, we don't make things better. We make things worse. God doesn't need our help, ever. Okay, just say that yourself to your mind. God doesn't need my help. Okay, now say it with meaning. (laughs) God doesn't need my help. But but like us as well, the problem is we can think that when we help, we're being successful. Jacob's going to get the blessing here. But as the result of this determination, I'm going to figure it out, and I'm going to maneuver, and I'm going to manipulate, she is never going to see her family sit around the table together again. Never. As a mom, that's going to break her heart. And even her beloved Jacob, he's going to have to flee for his life to Uncle Laban's house, and she will never see him again after this episode. Her determination, yeah, I can fix this, it caused more damage than it needed to. Real painful damage in her life because I, 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 can, I can get what God wants in my, I can do it myself, okay? So there's Isaac's, what did Isaac do? He disobeyed. There's Isaac's disobedience. There's uh, Rebecca, her determination. It's coming to me. It's third service. And now scene three, number three, is Jacob's deception. Verse 18. So he, Jacob, went to his father and said, my father, certainly trying to disguise his voice, right? And he said, 
here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. Now, as I said, Jacob's not some youngster. He's not someone that, like, oh, I just got to do what my mama says. You know, he's 77 years old. He knows better, and he's choosing deception. This is his choice. Remember what he said in verse 12? I want God's goodness. I want God's blessing in my life. But if I, I'll need to deceive to get it, I'm willing to do that, right? He, he's, I'm going to be a hypocrite just so, so I can, I'm going to seem like something else so I can, I can get this blessing, right? So he just didn't want to see. He's a deceiver. He just didn't want to seem like a deceiver. But that's exactly who he is, and he just keeps digging deeper and deeper. Verse 20, Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, look at this, because the Lord your God brought it to me. He lies again and again. Verse 21, Isaac said to Jacob, please come near me that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands... The, the hands are a goat. Yeah, they feel like a goat. No, the hands are of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. And so he blessed him. And he said, are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, verse 25, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank, and certainly that probably helped all of this too. Verse 26, then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he, Isaac, smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him. He's like, oh, the food, the hair, the voice, maybe, maybe not, but there's no mistaking that smell. That smell is Esau. I know that, Okay. You know, that's what he's thinking, because look what he says. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Okay? What's a blessed field? It's a green field. How does a field get green? Fertilizer. He smells like the field, okay? Verse 28, therefore, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Uh, be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. The lesson that we learn from Jacob is that deception breeds more deception. If you're committed to an outcome, I'm going to do this, this other way and I got to cover up this. One lie will multiply. It always leads to more. Deception will take you to destinations you never thought you'd get to. It'll always take you where you never intended to go. I don't believe that lying to his father, invoking the name of God, your, your God blessed me, right? Taking the Lord's name in vain, causing a rift in this family that will never be overcome. I don't think that was on his mind when he woke up that day and said, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do all of, cause all of this destruction. But that's where deception brought him. But again, there's this unfortunate side that like mom and dad, the problem is it seems like initially the deception works. Jacob does receive the blessing. And we'll go into greater detail if you're able to be with us on Wednesday or listen online. We'll, we'll go into some of the details of that. But as this tragedy unfolds before us, he's going to find for himself personally, this deception causes years and years and years and years of pain and difficulty. And as I said, the whole family is never going to be together again. And he's, he's got a part in that from his deception. But at this time, at this moment, when he walks out of Isaac's tent, he does so with not only the blessing of his father, he does so with this blessing that's been handed to Abraham, to, to Isaac, and, and now it, it's been handed to him that from his family, this is the family the Messiah is going to come from. 
Okay, so that's the first three scenes of this tragedy. Scene four is Esau's devastation. Verse 30, now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Verse 31, he also had made savory food and brought it to his father, and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. Verse 32, and his father Isaac said, who are you? So he said, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly. Can you just, it's, yeah, just picture this, right? This old man sitting in the tent, just shaking in, in fear. And said, Who? Where's the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I, I ate all of it before you came, and I've blessed him, and indeed, he shall be blessed. I, I think myself that this trembling is the result of him in a moment realizing I can't thwart God's plans. I thought I could be disobedient and still get the result I wanted, and I can't. God's will is greater than my disobedience. I, I think that's what's causing this trembling. So Isaac's trembling, and then verse 34, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with exceedingly great and, uh, great and bitter cry. And so Isaac's trembling exceedingly. Esau is crying exceedingly, and he said to his father through the tears, bless me, me also, O oh my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit, and he's taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob, which means uh, one who trips up? Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Now he's taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I've made him your master. And all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I've sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? Verse 38, and Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, bless me also, O oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. I, I can't go through here without noticing, without mentioning uh, and pointing out the fact that this is, a, again, a 77-year-old man who's established. He's, he's going to be okay. But what he really wants in life is the blessing of his father. And that cannot be overlooked, and I don't want to overlook it this morning, that no matter how old your kids are, they appreciate and want to know that their father loves them and has, wants to give them blessing, wants good things for their life. So if you're dad, take heart, take note to that. Then Isaac, let's see, verse 39, Isaac, his father answered him and said, and this is this secondary blessing now, behold, your dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. Now, I love the New King James Version. It's fantastic for teaching. I don't necessarily believe that it's translated correctly here. Almost all other translations say, if you have it, it says, away from the fatness of the earth. Away from the dew. This is a, an opposite blessing of what Jacob has received. Jacob received the fatness and the dew. And, and you saw, you're away from all of that. And that's, that's going to be the reality. He, the his descendants, the Edomites, are desert people. They live in the desert, right? So that's, that's what he's saying here. And he goes on to say in verse 40, by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. This lesson, finally, from the fourth member of the family, from Esau, is that you can't live any way you want and still expect to receive God's best for your life. And this is an important lesson. Maybe more important for some of us than others here this morning. Now, it, let's pause that for a second. It, if you're just reading this story for the first time, maybe you, you're, you're unfamiliar with the Bible, unfamiliar with the book of Genesis and, and this, if you're just reading this, you might tend to be like, I really feel for Esau. Those tears, right? 
when we understand who he is, his character, the context, his nature, we got to understand Esau is not a victim here, okay? There's tears, yes, but tears do not equate to victim, okay? I want you to look. I have a heading here, and it's really disappointing in my Bible, but look at the next verse. Look at verse 41. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, then I'll kill my brother Jacob. Esau was not, he is not a righteous man, and he has no desire going forward from this moment of tears. He has no desire to be a righteous man. Okay? This has been his track record all along. We're we're told that that in Scripture that he despised his birthright. I don't want that patriarchal uh, responsibility. I don't want the the spiritual responsibility that comes with the birthright to, to lead my family in a spiritual way. I don't want any of those things. I have zero concern for the things of God, okay? That has been his track record for 77 years, and now all of a sudden, no, he wants the blessing of God without living for God. He wants the benefits and the blessing without the responsibility. And when he finds out, I can't have all the goodness of God and live the way that I want to, that produces tears. That's what he's weeping over. I just want to keep living the way I want to live and receive from God's good and gracious hand. Like too many people, he wants the blessing of God in his life and to still live in the flesh. If you take notes, Hebrews 12 tells us that he has tears, but these are not tears of repentance. That's not what's taking place. And it's a, it's a tragedy when we take matters into our own hand. All, and every single one of these characters in this story has. They all value the blessing. They all want God's goodness in their life. They want a, a, a leaf that will never wither. They want fruit in season. They want to prosper continually. They all value the blessing. They all understand its importance, but none of them trust God's method to make it come to pass in their lives. Pastor Kent Hughes put it this way, everyone in the family sought the blessing of God without bending the knee to God. This little family was fraught with ambition, jealousy, envy, lying, deceit, coveting, malice, manipulation, stubbornness, and stupidity, and everyone lost. It's a tragedy, my friends, to seek and replace, like Isaac, the will of God with your own will. It's a tragedy when, like Rebecca, we think, I got to maneuver and manipulate and I got to try to do all of these things and then I'll receive God's blessing. It's a tragedy when we live a life of hypocrisy. Look at me, I'm doing the things I'm supposed to do. God's going to bless it because I, I look like I'm, I'm the right way. Look like I'm doing that thing. That's a tragedy. And it's a tragedy when you seek to just do your life your own way and then expect God to bless you. Trying to lay hold of God's blessing outside of God's way always leads to tragedy, and that's not what God wants for you. God wants you to prosper. Not like those guys on TV, not prosperity gospel. God wants you rich and never sick and any of those things. Okay, that's not biblical, but God wants you to prosper like the Psalm 1 man. God wants to bless you. He wants you to be a city on a hill. And we all want that. We all want his goodness in our, in our ministries, how we serve, in our marriages, in our families, for our kids. We want God's blessing in every area of our lives. Amen? But in order to lay hold of that blessing, we have to lay hold of it God's way and not our way. And maybe that's for us to, the 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 consideration that we have to take in our own life this morning, the evaluation. I, God's blessing, I want it. How are you trying, how am I trying to attain God's goodness? God's blessing is available for you, okay? He wants to bless you. It's available for you. You want it, and it's by grace. It's always, only, and ever by grace grace, and his grace is available to each and every one of us, and we experience this blessing 
when we receive Jesus, when we abide in him, when we walk with him, when we obey him and we trust him. Psalm 3, verses 5 and 6, many of you guys have this memorized. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All, all means all. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Amen? That requires trust. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for this pointed lesson um, from this scene, this tragedy in the life of Isaac, Lord. And I pray uh, that you know, we all learn from experience, Lord. And I just pray that we can learn from their experience that we don't have to continue. If we're living in disobedience, that we would stop, <laughs> that we would learn from Isaac. Or, or if we're trying to maneuver, trying to set things up, trying to just figure it out. This is how I'm going to have a blessed life, that we would just set that aside, that we wouldn't live this life of hypocrisy and deception, and also, Lord, that we wouldn't just go our own way and think you're going to bless us, but, Lord, that we'd be found in Jesus, that we'd press into him, that we'd abide. And, Lord, as we dig those roots deep into who you are, that, Lord, we would bear fruit in and out of season, have leaves that never wither, and that everything we do would prosper. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.